All right, chemists, in the last lesson, we looked at hydration of alkenes. Today, we're just gonna look at how we do this with alkynes. Can we take a triple bond, effectively add a net addition of water to get an H on one carbon and an OH on the other? And the truth is we can. However, we don't get what looks like an alcohol in the end. You'll see that we actually start to make carbonyl functional groups, things like ketones and aldehydes. Uh, there's only two new reactions to learn today, and they are the counterparts to what we saw for alkenes. Uh, one is Markovnikov, and one is non-Markovnikov. And we'll start with the Markovnikov one. This I'm just going to call alkyne hydration. And I'm using a linear terminal 5-carbon alkyne for this. There's a couple of different ways you could do this. Uh, one is just acidic hydrolysis, but you could use uh, mercury salt uh, in strong acid. When you treat a 5-carbon terminal alkyne, this is terminal, as opposed to the alkyne being in the middle of the chain somewhere, you would call that an internal alkyne. If I treat a terminal alkyne like this, I get a ketone that looks like that. So let's see how we get this. Why don't we get the alcohol like we saw with hydration of alkenes? To do that, let's first redraw the alkyne. This is five carbons. I'm trying to show the linear geometry when I'm drawing a line structure, you should too. This is under acidic conditions. The first thing is the pi bond picks up an H. So draw an arrow from one of the pi bonds to the H plus. That makes you lose one pi bond. And following what feels like Markovnikov's rule, you get the more substituted carbocation, very bizarre looking vinylic cation, but it's better than the one on the other carbon. And then water sees this carbocation and forms a bond. So draw an arrow from the oxygen of water to the plus charge. get a new carbon oxygen bond and now your plus charge is on the oxygen and like many things we've seen in the days of SN1 another water molecule if it's a solvent could come along take away that H and you get what looks like a pretty reasonable product at first and you actually do form this this is called an ene all that's just a hybrid of the words alkene and alcohol. You see it in the New York Times crossword all the time as a four little four letter word that just pops up. Anyway, enols are not very stable. They rearrange into a carbonyl because a carbonyl is much more thermodynamically stable. And under acidic conditions, this is how it happens. The pi bond forms a bond with the H. So you actually break that other pi bond. And now you get a plus charge on the more substituted carbon right there. Don't you dare call that tertiary. That's better than a tertiary carbocation because it's resonance stabilized. So draw a resonance contributor that shows the, a pair of electrons from the oxygen come down and delocalize that charge up to the oxygen. Now remember for resonance, these are two different versions of the same thing. I'm gonna argue that the one on the right is a more significant contributor because it satisfies the octet on every atom, and you should too. We are almost done though, if we're trying to explain the formation of the ketone, all that's left is I have to lose that last H. So another water molecule can take that last H away from this contributor and neutralize the oxygen. And that's how you get your ketone. Now that transformation, that overall rearrangement from enol to a carbonyl, in this case a ketone, is such a well-known transformation, we give it its own name. Just this part is called a tautomerization. It tautomerizes. This is an example of this happening in acid, and we'll see another one in base in just a moment. But overall, it looks like a Markovnikov addition of H and OH across the alkene. It just doesn't stay put as the enol. That rearranges. So that's the Mark Markovnikov version. What's the non-Markovnikov version? It's an analog to hydroboration. So here comes alkyne hydroboration. This is a special borane reagent that's commonly used. It's not the only one, but it's that boron hydrogen bond that does the chemistry. I'm using the same five carbon terminal alkyne. So here we have a terminal alkyne, just like above. And this gives you a five carbon chain, but your carbonyl is gonna be on the very end, which is not a ketone. Think back to what your functional groups are. That's an aldehyde. 
I like to draw in the H of any aldehyde. You don't have to, but I'm of the school of people that likes to do it. So how did we get the aldehyde out of this? Uh, let's redraw that terminal alkyne. And in this case, I'm gonna show a little bit of that boron reagent. Remember we said in the previous lesson that even though we used BH3 for alkene hydroboration, uh, there are many reagents out there where there's only one hydrogen on the boron and that works just fine. In fact, it often works better because you don't get over addition and it's a steric argument as to why the boron goes to the less substituted carbon and it happens here as well. So when this boron hydride species sees the alkyne, uh, we have an arrow pushing that looks like this, where the pi bond attacks the boron and it lines itself up so that it's on the less substituted side of the pi bond and the hydride simultaneously forms a bond with that more substituted carbon. So you lose a pi bond, the more substituted carbon will get the H, the less substituted carbon will get the boron and it's got two R groups along for the ride. That's the hydroboration step, just like it was for an alkene. You lose one of the pi bonds. And just like we saw for the alkene reaction, when you treat this with peroxide and base, I'm not gonna draw the arrows for this, it does the same thing. It converts the carbon boron bond into a carbon oxygen bond. So we turn our carbon boron bond into an enol. So we have another enol and this will also tautomerize to make a carbonyl but in this case it's an aldehyde and in this case it's not under acidic conditions it's under basic conditions so how does this happen under basic conditions well hydroxide will deprotonate the enol you get what's called an enolate conjugate base of an enol and like the answer to everything this is resonance stabilized so i can get that negative charge on a carbon, and that forms the carbonyl. We're just one H away from the actual product, the actual aldehyde. Remember, that's just resonance. You don't have to put it in brackets, but sometimes it's nice to highlight that that's what that is. Uh, we made water a moment ago. We're gonna use it and protonate that negative charge. And that's how you get your aldehyde. So this is also called a tautomerization because it's still going from an enol to a carbonyl, but we're under basic conditions instead of acidic, which just means that both can happen. So those are the two ways we can hydrate an alkyne, both to make carbonyls. Make a note, if it's not a terminal alkyne, but it's an internal alkyne, uh, there's no such thing as Markovnikov or non-Markovnikov addition to that because it's symmetric. There's carbons on both sides. Even if you have methyl on one side and ethyl on the other, sometimes you can get some selectivity of these reactions, particularly if it's driven by sterics, uh, but it's a little harder to control than if it was a terminal alkyne. So speaking of that, let's think about what kinds of alkynes we could use and wrap up with a quick example that shows how one of these ketones cannot be made with the alkyne hydration we just learned. So let's go backwards. If I wanted to make this ketone from an alkyne, that means that this used to be an enol, and I'll actually draw that as an enol. That would be prior to the tautomerization. And then what did that look like prior to becoming an enol? Well, it used to be an alkyne. And that works just fine. There's nothing conceivably wrong about that alkyne. Let's try it for some of the others. Right below it, I'll do the same thing. I'll show what enol this used to be. I'm just turning the oxygen into a OH. And then the alkene, uh, if that used to be an alkyne, hopefully you realize before I even draw this, this is utter nonsense. You cannot have this. So it's this second one that cannot be made. We'd have to make this ketone some other way. Can't happen here. First one is fine, second one no good. What about the other two? This used to be an enol that could look like that. And that could come from a terminal alkyne that would look like that. So no problem there. And the last one. 
just putting a double bond on one side of where the oxygen is. That could be from that enol, which could come from that alkyne. Also no problem. Interesting example to end with. You could imagine what would it look like if I started with this different enol. Could that work? Sure. Where was the alkyne then? Well, then it was here. And notice this is an internal alkyne, uh, as is this one, but this is not symmetrically substituted. So this works fine because this is a symmetric alkyne. And the one below it that's not symmetric, not as good, would not be as effective because you could imagine attacking this at the carbon where we want it to go to make this product over here. But alternatively, you could imagine attacking the other carbon that's closer to the end, and then you would get a completely different ketone uh, on a different position to get a constitutional isomer. So this reaction works really well for terminal alkynes and also uh, symmetric alkynes. In fact, let's make a note of that. These work well with terminal and or symmetric alkynes. And that example is meant to show you why. Okay, so that's how you take an alkyne and turn it into a ketone or an aldehyde.